بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Our, our discussion is going to be on end of life issues. Uh, the first issue that we shall discuss is that of palliative care. Uh, palliative care is care that we give to a patient for whom cure is not possible. So we give them palliation to make their life as comfortable as possible until the moment of death. Uh, death can be a pleasant uh, experience if palliative care is done very well so that the patient can be happy, relaxed during uh, the last moments of uh, life. Actually, during this time, many noble qualities appear in the human because towards the end of life, the person knows that they are no longer on this earth. Uh, they are not after any glory, after any money, after any possessions. So they become noble. Their noble qualities do appear. They forgive people who did wrong to them. They can ask for forgiveness from people they did wrong to. So nobility of the human appears a lot towards the end of life. But we need to help the patient to be able to realize uh, and experience these uh, uh, noble human qualities. Also, during the period of palliative care, we need to talk to the patient about the hereafter to make them understand that death is not a terminal event. Death is an event of transition from one life to another, from Hayat al dunya to Hayat al akhirah and Hayat al akhirah is better than Hayat al dunya So we can make the transition uh, easier for them to deal with when we talk to them about uh, the hereafter and the life that is much better than the life of uh, the dunya. The guiding principles on terminal care is to make sure that the patients are taken care of uh, in terms of their physical needs. Uh, they need food, they need hydration, they need hygiene. We need to take care of their spiritual needs. We need to help them make uh, their ibadah, their salah, as much as uh, uh, possible uh, in the knowledge that this is all we can do. But most important, we need to take care of pain. Nobody should die suffering from a lot of pain. Now, uh, palliative care has developed. At the beginning, it was undertaken in the home because most people a long time ago died in their own home. But now it has become a specialty in, in medical practice. We've got uh, special units in hospitals and we've got even standalone institutions called uh, hospices. Uh, the resources for terminal care are many. Uh, we need medical resources, we need nursing resources, but also we need spiritual resources, religious resources. We need people who can take care of the various needs uh, of the patient. Palliative care, as I said, could be in the home, and this is preferable if it's possible. But if the people at home don't have the resources to take care of the patient, uh, we may go to a hospital hospice unit or a standalone uh, hospice. And uh, we may have a palliative care team consisting of specialized doctors and nurses visiting the home of the patient and taking care of uh, uh, their needs. Now, what do we provide in palliative care? The most important is pain control. We should control pain so that people do not die uh, when they are suffering from a lot of pain. And we've got a lot of drugs to take care of pain. We need to take care of their spiritual needs. So maybe somebody, uh, a religious teacher, religious leader, who talk to them about spirituality. Uh, doctors and nurses at the hospital should also train to be able to discuss these spiritual uh, matters because uh, there may be no specialist to take care of that. We must take care of their emotional needs. They need to connect with their families, with their loved ones. So we need to make sure that emotionally they are connected and they are stable. Uh, psychological welfare. We need to be able to communicate with them uh, all the time. One of the mistakes that happen is that when healthcare providers realize somebody 
is in the terminal stages, they stop communicating with them. They still need communication all the time, like any other patient. We must manage their symptoms. They may have vomiting, they may have diarrhea, they may have fever. All of this must be uh, treated so that they are physically as comfortable as possible. And we need to make sure that they have got adequate nutrition and adequate hydration. There are issues that arise during palliative care. Uh, patients at this stage of life may not be able to make decisions about their care. So we need to rely on advanced statements. Maybe when they were in good health, they wrote or said what they want to be done to them when they are no longer able to speak or able to communicate. Uh, they could have chosen proxy decision makers. They say, if I am no longer competent, someone can make decisions for me. Or uh, if there is no proxy decision maker chosen in advance, a guardian wali uh, could take care of that. Normally, uh, a wali is uh, uh, a close uh, family uh, relationship. Uh, we need to respect the decisions of the guardians and the proxy decision makers. Uh, uh, but if there are no relatives at all, uh, it may fall upon the uh, medical professions to make the best decisions that they think are in the best interest of the uh, patients. Now, the decisions that have got to be made include nutrition, uh, decisions on hydration, decisions on pain control, and decisions on uh, treatment of uh, infections. Now, let me talk more about pain control. Uh, the drugs that control pain also cause sedation. So the patient may be sleeping all the time and this will affect their social life. They may not be able to communicate with, with their family as they would have done without these drugs. So we may need to establish a, a balance, a fine balance between controlling the pain and letting them have some social life so that they can talk uh, with their families. Now, analgesics, uh, and these are the drugs that uh, control pain, could have a double effect. They may uh, control pain, but at the same time, they may cause other side effects, such as uh, uh, respiratory depression. So we need to know uh, where the balance is. In terminal stages of life, sometimes patients get uh, dispirited, demotivated, and they may actually ask for death. Tamanil uh, maut, hoping for death, is forbidden. And we should never assist them in any way uh, to die. We should always encourage them to continue with life. Uh, we may run into a problem. Should we tell the whole truth to the patient or not? Because they ask you, uh, what's my prognosis? Now, if you tell them the whole truth, it may depress them because they may not be able to deal with the truth as is. But also we do not want to tell them a lie. So it requires a careful balancing of the benefits and harms of disclosure of the reality to the patient. But generally, we need to be truthful to our patients. As long as they want to know, it's our duty to give them the information that they need. Maybe what we need to know is how and when to give the information and also to calibrate the speed at which you give the information. Maybe we don't tell them everything all at the same time. We need to respect the privacy and confidentiality of our patients. Whatever we see, whatever we hear, we need to keep it confidential and never disclose it to any other people. Uh, we need to, dis to respect the patient's autonomy. As long as they're competent to make decisions, we need to follow what they want and do not be paternalistic and uh, make decisions uh, for them. Now we will discuss some practical case scenarios uh, to apply the principles that we have discussed before. Uh, case scenario one is a 90-year-old in the intensive care unit with uh, stage four widely metastasized cancer uh, with many organs failing. So the organs tell him 
there is nothing they, the doctors tell him there is nothing they can do to reverse the disease and that they can only provide symptomatic treatment. So he says, okay, discharge me to go home. The children object. They say, well, you need complex nursing care. We cannot provide it at home. So the patient finally was admitted to a private hospice that provided uh, palliative care at great expense. Now, what are the ethical issues you see here? How would you solve this problem? Now, let us talk about terminally incurable diseases and end-of-life uh, decisions. Uh, a terminal illness is an illness from which recovery is not expected. It's called marvel mouth. Uh, another concept that we need to know is that of DNR, do not resuscitate. A patient may reach a stage in life that the doctors write an order that if the heart or the lungs or the respiration uh, stop, if the patient collapses, he or she should not be resuscitated because resuscitation is futile. They will uh, collapse again. Uh, the concept of withholding life support. There are situations in which the patient's condition is so critical that it's useless, it's futile to start artificial life support. Now, withdrawal of life support means that the patient is already on life support on machines, he's living on machines, and we need to reach a time to make a decision to withdraw those machines and allow the patient to die in a dignity. Uh, these issues are closely related to the concept of brain death. A long time ago, death was defined easily. When somebody's heart stopped beating or he stopped breathing, we knew he was dead. But because of modern medical technology, such a definition of death is no longer possible. So what we use now to define death is brain death. When the brain death, especially uh, the brain storm, when the brain stem uh, is dead, uh, the patient is considered dead and we could proceed to withdraw uh, life support. Euthanasia is a concept that is not permitted in Islamic law. Uh, it means uh, mass killing. The patient is suffering with a lot of pain, so uh, uh, the caregivers may take uh, actions that may be active to cause death or may be passive. Passive euthanasia means you don't do anything to support life and the patient passes away. So euthanasia is not allowed because life and death are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assisted suicide is also not allowed uh, if a patient is so desperate and they want to die and they ask the caregiver for advice or for help to kill themselves, we never do that for them. Uh, the terminally ill may need uh, very uh, difficult decisions to be made. Decisions on whether to withhold or withdraw life support and decisions on nutrition and hydration. We come across these decisions all the time in practice. Uh, if the patient is conscious and can make his or her own decisions, that's the best situation. But if the patient is incompetent, we may have to uh, resort to proxy decision makers, such as the family members, to help us with making these decisions. Now let us discuss some case scenarios to see how we can apply uh, the uh, principles that we have discussed above. This is a 30-year-old patient with multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is a disease that is terminal. Uh, the patient gradually goes down until uh, they die. Five years while in, before while in good health, the patient had chosen her husband as the decision maker. She said that if I lose consciousness, I want my husband to make a decision. Later on, five years later, she lost consciousness and the doctor needed a decision whether to put her on life support or not. 
The husband had by this time remarried and lived in a separate house. He decided against life support because he said it will prolong her suffering. Her father intervened and said, no, I want life support because that would be in the best interest of uh, my daughter. Now, what are the ethical issues that arise in this case? What would be your solution to this problem? What would you decide to do given uh, differences in opinion between the husband and the, and the father? Case scenario two, this is a university professor who had previous episodes of transient stroke. And he had written a directive and had it witnessed that if he lost consciousness, he does not like to be resuscitated. Years later, after writing that, he was brought to the hospital unconscious. But this time, it was from head injuries sustained in a car accident. The doctor found his directive in his shirt pocket and they decided not to resuscitate him because they thought that he doesn't want to be resuscitated. His wife was around and insisted that he be resuscitated. Now, what are the ethical issues in this case and how would you resolve them? Case scenario number three, doctors wrote a DNR order that means do not resuscitate for an 80 year old grandmother who had disseminated cancer and um, uh, her family uh, when told of the DNR decision they said no we don't want DNR it must be reversed before this dispute between the doctors and the family was resolved the patient collapsed from acute pneumonia this is a disease unrelated to her original condition for which the DNR order had been written. So the nurses following the DNR order did not call the resuscitation team. Now, what do you think of the nurses' action? Is it ethical or not ethical? Uh, give reasons for your moral reasoning. Case scenario number four is a 70-year-old man with advanced cancer and severe pain. This pain was not responsive to morphia, which is a pain-killing drug. And he asked the doctor to kill him and save him from suffering. The doctor said, no, I cannot commit homicide. I cannot kill somebody. Also, the doctor refused to give the patient any advice about suicide. But the patient insisted and the doctor agreed to stop hydration and nutrition so that the patient can die slowly. What do you think of this? What are the ethical issues? Is the doctor's decision right? Is it ethical? Do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? What is your moral reasoning for the decision that you choose? Case scenario number five, this is a car accident victim in severe shock, wheeled into the emergency room with no blood pressure or pulse. The ECG showed low amplitude uh, and slow uh, waves. The doctor didn't declare death, but against the insistence of the family members, he refused to uh, institute life support because he, he knew there was no hope. One hour later, the patient died. The family threatened to sue the doctor. What are the ethical issues in this scenario? Do you think the doctor's decision was right? Do you think the family's threat to sue the doctor is right ethically? Give your moral reasoning. Case scenario number six is a 90-year-old man with multiple organ failure and signs of brain stem death. He was on life support in the intensive care unit, occupying the last available bed. And doctors had kept him in the ICU because they didn't want to disclose the death to the family because they, they thought that the family members will make a lot of noise, will be angry. 
However, when 50 survivors from an air crash site were brought in, the doctors decided to withdraw life support from the old man to free up at least one bed for one of the survivors from the uh, air crash. What are the ethical issues in this scenario? How would you deal with this scenario if you are the doctor in charge? What do you think of the doctor's decision in this case? Case scenario number seven is that of a policeman who died suddenly during a fight with criminals. The criminals were later arrested. Now, the police wanted to carry out a post-mortem to determine the cause of death so that they can charge and punish the criminals with homicide. Some members of the family objected to the post-mortem examination on the grounds that it was against the Sharia. Other members support the post-mortem because uh, they needed the insurance compensation which wouldn't be given without a medically certified cause of death. Now, if you are faced with this situation, what would be your decision? What are the ethical issues that we need to consider uh, uh, in order to come to uh, a decision in this case? Now, let us talk about solid organ transplantation and donation, uh, which is an issue that comes up regularly in uh, terminal uh, illness. Uh, the rulings about transplantation can be related to Qaidat al Mashaqa, Qaidat al Dharar, and Qaidat al Qasad. Qaidat al Mashaqa says this is the principle of uh, hardship. It says that when there is a difficulty, uh, we can do things that are not normally done. For example, uh, for the purposes of saving a, someone's life, we may take organs from uh, a dead body and transplant them into somebody living. Normally, it is considered offensive to mutilate the dead body, but because of the necessity to uh, save life, uh, it can be allowed under Qadat al uh, The scholars say, al to be al-mahdurat. Then there is Qadat al the principle of injury. This says that in order to make a decision, we need to weigh the benefits and the harms of a procedure. So in the case of transplantation, we can weigh the benefits uh, to the person who will receive the organ against the harm that can arise from the operation to the donor or the recipient. Uh, we also need to consider the principle of uh, intention, qadat al qasad. What's the intention behind the process of uh, organ harvesting and organ transplantation? If it's a good intention of saving life, it's understandable. But sometimes there could be commercial considerations which uh, make the process uh, unacceptable. We need to get informed consent uh, in order to transplant organs. Now, selling organs, kidnapping people for their organs, these are illegal and are forbidden by the Sharia because there is no consent. We need to consider uh, the complications and side effects of a transplantation, both in the recipient and in the donor. Uh, procuring and harvesting organs have become uh, very common now because the technology has become very advanced. They now have few uh, side effects and I think uh, they are going to become uh, more widespread as healthcare services become more available. Case scenario one. A doctor in the intensive care unit kept a brain stem dead patient. As we mentioned before, when the brain stem is dead, the patient is legally dead. But the doctor kept this patient on artificial life support to maintain the organs until the transplant team can arrive to harvest the heart and the lungs that the patient had donated while conscious to his cousin who was born with severe congenital abnormalities and would die without the transplantation. Now, what do you think of the action of the doctor? 
Is it ethical to keep somebody dead on artificial, artificial life support? What's your reasoning? What's your moral reasoning uh, to support uh, your opinion? Thank you very much for listening.